Windows is getting much better for gamers. The US government now owns a significant chunk of Intel and AMD pulled off an oopsie, a big one. <laughs> they shouldn't have done that. Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast this Monday, August 25th, 2025. We're gonna start off with reports coming out about Microsoft and all of the changes that they're gonna be making to Windows for their upcoming Xbox RG Ally handheld console that they're partnering with Asus to make. So at Gamescom last week, they discussed a few changes that are going to be coming out in regards to both software as well as just kind of compatibility things that are going on. So they will have a handheld compatibility program that's kind of like Valve's Steam Deck Verified setup that has expanded to be like SteamOS compatible now that the Legion Go S's have SteamOS on them. But the general idea is that you're gonna at a glance be able to see whether or not a game is good to run with the RG Xbox Ally with Microsoft working with game studios to test, optimize, and verify these games very much like Valve has been doing for the Steam Deck. So there's some things that are gonna say should play great, should play well, and it's a Windows performance fit and metric for you to know exactly what you're getting into before you load it up. It's helpful, this was needed before they uh, had an official partnership and I'm, I'm glad that it's happening, but they're also changing the Xbox app to be more of a unified hub that includes all of the other game launchers. The new Xbox app is gonna have featured third-party stores such as God Galaxy, Ubisoft, Steam, Battle.net, and you don't even have to go outside of the Xbox app. They're really trying to hone you in to using all of their own thing. And honestly, I'm not necessarily against this, especially since you still have full-fledged fat windows underneath this Xbox app. And it's primarily gonna be meant for people who are utilizing this in a handheld situation. First on the Xbox RG Ally, but hopefully then rolling out to all other uh, Windows handhelds that are gonna be out on the market. But that's not the biggest news that's coming out. It's actually their shader fix that they're gonna be implementing for Windows that's gonna make it so that you're having significantly less stutters and less loading time into your games that have to compile shaders first. We've all had to stare at our reflection while that's been going on. And now DirectX is gonna have it so that it's baked into what you download and allegedly cut loading times by up to 85% with 10 times faster game load speeds because it preloads game shaders during the download. And you might be wondering why this never happened before is because it's gonna take a significant effort by Microsoft to work with devs to get them to do this. So essentially, they're gonna have all of the details that would normally get called onto during the game loading cycle be prepped in the download cycle so that it actually happens while the download is processing, not necessarily when you're loading the game for the first time. Again, this is gonna take some effort by Microsoft. It's gonna take some effort by game devs, but if they partner together, it's gonna to be a much better gaming situation on handhelds, but also for hopefully everybody else. It should be something that is implemented into Windows, making it so that DirectX games are just significantly smoother from the jump. And if you wanna be smoother just in real life, you should definitely check out today's video sponsor. You guys smell that? Smells to me like an easy and affordable way to experience a variety of scents and fragrances. And boy, oh boy, does it smell good. All through today's sponsor, Scentbird. While I would still consider myself a newbie in the fragrance world, some of the other UFD guys here have been sampling smells since high school, and Scentbird has been great for everyone in this office. Something that I've really come to appreciate about Scentbird after spending some more time with the samples is the carrying case. The form factor makes it so you can just stash this in your pocket, in a bag, or even in your car for a quick refresh on a long day out. It also makes sure that the vial of your precious sniffing juice stays safe while it's bouncing around with whatever weird stuff you keep in your backpack. For my second round of fragrances this month, Scentbird paired me up with four new and great scents. Starting off, we have Ocean Noir by Michael Maloul. This is a light, clean, and citrusy fragrance that feels perfect for everyday wear. Notes of marine mist, tangelo, black coconut, sea kelp, and amber wood lend to a subtly sweet but refined scent. Next, we have Anthony Silver by Anthony. This warm and bold scent would be great for an evening out or a seasonal scent for the fall. Notes of bergamot and orange provide a crisp citrus scent that blends well with the earthy and sweet notes of sandalwood, vanilla, and olibanum. The standout for me this month is definitely the Fig Me Up by Mansara Paris. This fruity yet savory scent is dominated by the initial notes of fig and plum, giving a rich and sweet start. The additional notes of oud, sandalwood, and tonka bean provide a subtle earthiness that round out the fragrance. And last 
but not least, we have the Mind Energy by the Nuco. This bold and pepper fragrance is almost certainly for evening wear. Notes of pink pepper, clove, and cedarwood offer a strong, warm scent, softened slightly by the crisp and herbal notes of spearmint and juniper. Having sampled so many fragrances lately, it's really made me realize how nose blind I am to the smells around me. So if you've been using one single cologne for a really long time, you're definitely not noticing that fragrance anymore. Do yourself and the people around you a favor and find something to mix it up with maybe a seasonal rotation of scents. If you're interested in trying Scentbird, scan the QR code or use the link below. And with my coupon code, you'll get 55% off at Scentbird. Plus, you'll get free delivery to your door and a free case. You get the product for half of the price. That's just $8. It's a steal. And huge thanks again to Scentbird for sponsoring. Let me know if you like the scent of what's going on in this story, which is that Intel and the US government are now partners in the most official sense that the US government now has a 10% shareholder stake in the Intel company. So on the Intel newsroom, they published last week that the US government has made an $8.9 billion investment into Intel common stock that is partially being funded by the CHIPS Act that was already passed by the previous US administration. However, 5.7 billion of that was outstanding and that's gonna be used to purchase the stock. And then there's the 3.2 billion that was already awarded as part of the Secure Enclave program. And then there was also $2.2 .2 billion in grant money that that they got from the CHIPS program that has made the US government's total investment into Intel to be $11.1 .1 billion, but not all of that is stuck. So Intel absolutely going through with the partnership with the US government, trying to have itself be the preeminent chip manufacturer of the United States. And there were some comments by President Trump with regards to as to why this actually happened. And it surrounds the comments that were made by President Trump with regards to the CEO, Le Bouton, and how he should have resigned. At which point the CEO of Intel went to the president and discussed a few things, which the president states was wanting to keep his job and he ended up giving us $10 billion for the United States and saying that I think it would be a good idea having the United States as your partner with the CEO agreeing and they've agreed to do it and they think it's a great deal for them. So that's the general sentiment that Intel was gonna be out another CEO if this didn't go through. However, this doesn't include board seats for the US government. It just happens to be the 10% stock investment. But further reports going on with the CHIPS Act because that didn't just apply to Intel. It also applied to Micron and TSMC and several other companies. It turns out that the equity thing is going to be mostly exclusive to Intel. It might happen with a few other companies, but it's not going to be obligated of everyone participating in the CHIPS Act. It just happens to be an Intel thing that's going on. So let me know what you think of Intel, the U.S. government partnering up, the U.S. government being now a major stakeholder in Intel. Not a majority, but still major. Let me know down below in the comments. But speaking of the U.S. government being involved in company affairs, Apple got the U.S. government to thank for allowing them to bring back their blood pressure situation to their Apple Watches. However, the company that had the lawsuit out against them that caused them to remove it in the first place, Massimo, is upset and now has sued the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency because it only found out about the ruling that allowed Apple to bring it all back with Apple's press announcement on August 1st with Massimo saying that they were never informed of all these changes and they think they should have had a hand in the process of some of this stuff being overturned. So we'll see how all of that plays out, but that's not the only thing Apple's got going on with their Apple Watch situation. They're also in a lawsuit against a former employee who allegedly stole information and brought it over to Oppo for their watch stuff. So Apple's got a lot of controversy going on with their watches. And I want you to watch Reese save you money. He'll do it. He's a big boy. Yo, welcome back to UFT Deals, bringing the hottest tech deals on the internet. Happy Monday, everyone. Hope you guys had a good weekend, and here's your deals. Starting off, we have the NZXT H3 Flow Micro ETX case for only $59.99, making it $20 off. But then doubling up on the cases, we have the Cooler Master Cube 500 Flat Pack, which is their fold-down ATX mid-tower case, going for only $74.99, making it $25 off. And then lastly, we have this KTC monitor featuring 27 inches at 1440p, 180 hertz, for only $149.99. And hey, with that, the deal are done you can find these and more linked in the video description down below but until next time man you're back to bread for the rest of your hot news cheers well reese i'm gonna need every single cent of what you just saved me to pick up one of these the minis form ms s1 max just got announced and it's yet another strix halo mini desktop this is not necessarily something super novel we've seen several of these be announced you have the framework desktop you have the corsair workstation there's been a couple others that have been out there but 
This Minis Form 1 has a couple unique features that get me very excited and makes me want to throw money at my screen, which is, number one, a much higher TDP coming in at 160 watts, when most other Strix Halos are coming in at 120 watts. So you're getting a 33% power increase on this. Whether or not that's peak power or sustained power, not quite clear, but they're claiming it's 160. If that's true, it's gonna be phenomenal. Number two, it comes with a full length PCI Express 16 slot, which allows you to install other graphics cards in case you want to, especially if you're using this thing for machine learning or anything that's being used locally, with it also having a 320 watt power supply cable, so you can install your own GPUs without having to necessarily go out and buy another power supply to do it externally. But then on top of that, it also has USB 4 V2, which I think this is one of the first implementations I'm hearing of it in a consumer product, which is the second version of USB 4, allowing for up to 80 gigabits per second of transfer speed, with it having two of those ports. So essentially, it's going to have most of the capabilities of Thunderbolt 5 without having to actually be Thunderbolt 5. Thunderbolt 5 does also have 120 gigabit situation, but that's mostly it's 80 gigabit. This MS S1 Max has a lot going for it. They have not announced the price. I didn't even mention the two 10 gigabit ethernet ports that are also on this thing. It's probably going to cost a pretty penny, especially if it comes with the 128 gigabyte RAM version of the Strix Halo chip, but that this is a mighty fine little computer. And while I'm celebrating the successes of Strix Halo and saying it's mighty fine, turns out AMD did something last week that wouldn't be considered mighty fine. In fact, it would be considered a screw up, a little oopsie, which is they posted FSR4 all over GitHub as a free open source software setup. AMD published the entire full source code for FSR4 over on GitHub. And with that, there was some intriguing information that came out with regards to it looks like FSR4 might might potentially get lower generation GPU support later on down the line because it has Int 8 support, which could work for the Radeon 7000 series. So think your 7900 XTX might be able to run it. But in case you're wondering, hey, AMD's always been committed to like open source stuff. Turns out, they didn't want to do that for FSR. So Cheese over from Chips and Cheese says that they got an update directly from AMD and GPU Open and that it was an error. They should not have done it and they have since taken it down. The whole thing was not supposed to be open source. But with that, they use the MIT license, which is irrevocable and has fully permissive license. So in theory, again, this is being speculated by a bunch of people who are currently not in law school or have any sort of lawyer degree, but that MIT license for the people who have forked, cloned, or copied the re they should actually still be able to use it under that license. And the only way that could be violated is if AMD didn't have ownership of all of the source code when they published it, which is not the case. AMD actually does fully own their FSR4 source code. And so it could be potentially that when you go over and you see the Fidelity FX SDK and all the details with FSR4, as you can see here, people have absolutely copied those repos. These might not get taken down. And so the open source situation for FSR4 might continue into the future. In case you're wondering, didn't didn't AMD want to make FSR some sort of open source? The truth is they have been doing that. FSR 1, 2, and 3 were released as open source, but they never said that they were going to do that with 4, and it doesn't look like they wanted to do that this soon. Potentially, they wanted to come out with 5 before they open source 4. We'll see how much this impacts anything to do with the company. Maybe it'll make it so that there's more mods in the future for lower generation cards being able to support it. This could allow the community to make some more strides and developments on working on their own things. We'll, we'll see how all of this plays up, but AMD made a little oopsie last week. It's good for the consumer, bad for, I guess, their stock price and any company secrets that they wanted to keep their uh, mitts on. And I want to get my mitts on your comments. So let's see what you had to say in last week's episode of Hot News. We have mitts saying, Yo, Brett, The Verge confirmed that the 720p for that Asus monitor was a misprint on the press release, and they have confirmed that it's 1080p. But then you can see that uh, edit Asus corrected their correction. This comment is now redundant. Lamau. Yeah, that was actually really confusing. There were so many comments of being like, no, it's actually 1080p. I was like, Number one, that doesn't make sense just because going from 1440 to 1080 when it comes to a uh, dual panel w w would be weird. It would be just, it's not a its not a good scaling situation. So I thought it was odd for that reason. But then number two, the amount of like marketing that said either 720p specifically or HD, not FHD, which would be 1080p. Like it was in multiple places. So it was like, how is this wrong like they it's not just one single issue it turns out that uh whichever person over at asus said it was 1080p 
was mistaken. It, it's 720p. It's a 1440p, 500 plus hertz monitor. I think it's 540. And then at 720p, it does 720 hertz. It's a wild OLED situation. I'm actually really intrigued by it. I think it's it's kind of neat, but uh, who knows if I'll ever get my hands on something like that. And we got the terrible gamer saying, I get locking features behind vendor specific hardware is bad, but could this move be because of the connector melting issue? To which Ryder made my defense that I was about to say, saying, but the thing is having two Two connectors would reduce that issue. Also info on why those connector burns are happening is pretty available out there. Though yes, I think the BTF option could reduce the connector issue. I saw a lot of commentary about um, how this is e Nvidia's fault because they don't allow two 16 pin power connectors, which is just not true. There's multiple other GPUs that use dual 12V2-6, 12V, 12 volt by 2-6. Naming scheme's not great, but there's multiple cards that use two of those power connectors. It's, it's not a novel thing to do that. So that's a pretty simple implementation, at least in the just thought process of put two on there, you're reducing the load on each of them, and therefore you should uh, reduce the melting issue on each of them. If they can each pull 400 watts, they can each pull 400 watts. But I think that would also assist in my argument that I don't like this being a vendor lockdown situation for you to get the most out of your card because they could make it so that you could either use two 16 pin power connectors or use one 16 pin and the BTF connector. Either situation would yield you the 800 watt power profile. So they could still justify the BTF connector. They could still talk about how their technology is great. You reduce the number of cables, yada, 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 but it wouldn't necessarily make it so that you're forced onto Asus motherboards. And then I also saw a couple people being like, Asus BTF is on other motherboards, which it's been announced on other motherboards, but it is not released. And I think the only other company that has said that they're gonna adopt Asus's BTF standard so far is Sapphire. And allegedly those are supposed to launch next month. But as of the time of filming, if you wanna use this card, and you want to use it to its full capacity, you have to buy an Asus motherboard. You cannot buy another company's, which is frustrating because BTF is, while it's technically their back to front, that's the acronym, it's their back connector situation. It's also the name of their power connector. So it's proprietary on the power connector, but like there's cases that support BTF and then MSI's Project Zero and Gigabyte Stealth or whatever they're calling it. It has the back connect motherboard standard. Asus is using BTF as like their general nomenclature for no wires, including the power connector. So they don't like it. And then we got Chris Graff saying, you had me at slim shaft. Yeah? Huh. What a world. 